Thank you, worship team, for leading us in praise of our God this morning, today. And uh, hello, everyone. It's great to see you here. And for those watching online, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to invite you, if you have a Bible or a device at this time, to turn to Luke chapter 1. If you're new to the Bible, there's an index at the front, and uh, you can find the Gospel of Luke. Today we are launching into a study of this book that will take us to Easter. So the next five months, we're going to be going through uh, the Gospel of Luke. And Luke presents Jesus as the Savior of the world, that Jesus came to save you. That's the greatest news you could ever hear in your life. This Christmas season, maybe you're anticipating uh, a gathering with friends or family, or maybe it's a meal, maybe it's giving a gift or two. Those things are wonderful. They come and they go. Jesus is the greatest gift. He is the greatest news. And for the next five months, we're going to be lifting up our thoughts to better understand who he is and what he has done for us. And can I just say uh, for you, the more that you grow in your relationship with Jesus, the more whole you will become. Uh, you will experience his hope, his joy, his peace, and his love. So hear the good news today that Jesus has come and he is coming again, the greatest news of all. Well, we're rational human beings, and so that begs the question, is this bigger story about Jesus really true? Is the Bible really true? Is it the Word of God? Is Jesus really God in the flesh? Was he really born of a virgin? Is there really a heaven that I can go to when I die? And is there really a place called hell that is separation from God? Did, did Jesus really rise from the dead and ascend into heaven and he's coming again? These are questions that we need to wrestle with and which leads to doubts at times. Like, is this really true? And as we begin our study in the book of Luke, he wants to bring certainty to those doubts. He's going to make a formal declaration at the beginning of his book. Here's, let me tell you why I'm writing this book. It's so that you can be assured of the evidence of the things that have taken place, that you can be assured of what you have been taught about Jesus and the life to come. So Luke is going to address those doubts uh, right off the bat. But we also, as we go through life, can have doubts. Uh, we can begin to have doubts when God doesn't do something we want him to do or he hasn't done. God, I'm praying for this job. God, I'm praying for this relationship. God, I'm praying for uh, my health or someone's health. And sometimes God is silent. And we're like, wait a second. God, if you're really there, if you are really true, then you should do something and you're not doing anything. So maybe I'm believing something that's not true. Maybe I shouldn't you know, follow this Jesus person and be a Christian. And Luke is going to address those doubts more on a personal level with his first story. So on the bigger story, he's going to say, hey, um, here's what you can believe. But on, the, on your own story, he's going to talk about when God is silent. What's God doing in silence? Is he really doing something or isn't he? And he's going to open his book after his formal declaration, not with the birth of Jesus the Messiah, but with the birth of the one that was to come and prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah, someone we know now, looking back in history, as John the Baptist. That God had promised the Messiah, but he'd also promised to send this forerunner, someone that's going to, to make straight the ways of the Lord. And so he's going to open with that story. And so may you, as we listen to that story, may you you remind yourself of what God is doing in your story. Um, if you want to grow in your faith, you have to go straight through questions and doubt. So you can't do a spiritual bypass. You've got to look at, are these things really true? Um, so we're going to begin in Luke 1, but before we do, as we do with uh, studies of books where there's usually a few introductory comments, so as we, for the next five months, go through this book, here's a few things that we need to, to uh, remember. 
First, each of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they all have a different perspective that they want their readers to understand about Jesus. So they're all seeing, seeing the same Jesus, but they want us to understand something different about him. They want us to, uh, they're emphasizing certain things about Jesus. So Matthew, uh, for instance, he was uh, Jewish, and he wanted his Jewish readers to know that this promised Messiah has really come. The promised king has really come. And so he's going to emphasize Jesus as the Messiah king. Mark, he is going to emphasize for his readers that Jesus was a servant. He came to serve. And Mark is a very action-oriented book. Uh, not a lot of fillers. How many of you like to, just give me the bottom line. Mark is just kind of like, just boom, there he, there he is. Uh, John, he is um, highlighting and emphasizing that Jesus is the son of God. He is divine. And then Luke emphasizes that Jesus is the son of man. That Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. And he's going to help us to see that Jesus as a man got tired, he got hungry, and he's also going to help us to see that Jesus had this compassion for all people. If you sometimes have ever felt or you do feel like an outsider, I just don't seem to fit in, I'm just like, you know, maybe a little less than, that's how you feel, this gospel is for you. Because Jesus, uh, uh, Luke is going to give us story after story of outsiders meeting Jesus and that Jesus loved them and brought them in. So there's a few of the different uh, perspectives of the writer. So we're looking at the perspective of Luke. Now let's talk just for a moment about Luke the, the man. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jewish person. He was not a disciple of Jesus. He was not an eyewitness of Jesus. Second, he was a physician. Paul refers to, uh, our, in Colossians 4, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, the physician. And it's interesting, as we read through the Gospel of Luke in the next five months, pay attention to when um, Luke is sharing a story that's involving the physical and, uh, for example, when we get to the Garden of Gethsemane there, near the end of Jesus' life, it, uh, Luke says, he perspired uh, these droplets of blood. And uh, the Greek word is, is hermatido, uh, hermatido, hematidrosis, which is a medical condition. So he, unlike the other readers, he's giving us some medical terms about Jesus. So he is a physician. He's also a traveling companion of Paul. Um, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the good news was taken throughout the Roman Empire. And in the, gospel, in the book of Acts, we'll find mention of Acts from time to time traveling with Paul. He as well wrote the book of Acts. And then looking back, we see Luke was a historian. In the ancient world, uh, he told us about certain people, places, events. And what is very interesting as we look back, back and we look at history, we come to the conclusion he was an eminent historian. Everything he said, bang on. So he was also a historian. So with that in mind, let's now look at this God uh, who, who loves all of us, and let's look at Luke helping us to see the greatest news we could ever hear and that we would be assured in our faith, even though times we may have doubts. Luke chapter 1, beginning in 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most, the most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke begins, he says, there were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, these first disciples of Jesus, and they were sharing the events that took place, and many wrote down an account of these things. So Luke was um, thinking of Mark, which is the earliest gospel written. There's like Mark, and then there's others. And he said, they, they're writing accounts. I myself, I'm, I carefully investigated all of these events, and I'm now writing an orderly account. Now, interesting, eyewitness, you see the word eyewitnesses, uh, it's uh, the Greek word apokte, 
autocte, sorry, autocte, where we get our English word autopsy. Uh, that's where uh, we get our English word autopsy. And an autopsy, right, you are um, examining, investigating the body. And so these eyewitnesses, they were examining and investigating the events and sharing them. And Luke then says, I went and did this careful research. He was robust in his study. And so he's writing it down. Now, what is interesting, Luke, unlike the others, he gives us an account of the conception of Elizabeth, uh, of her baby, and the birth. And same with, with um, uh, Mary, uh, the conception and the birth uh, there with her child. Why does he do that? Well, because he's a doctor. But then we ask the question, how did he know that that happened with Jesus on that first Christmas being placed in a manger? How did he know all that? Because he carefully investigated. He would have interviewed Mary. He would have interviewed Elizabeth. He would have Peter, Paul, John. He would have interviewed, well, not, yeah, Paul saw the risen Christ later, but he would have interviewed these people with these um, accounts. And then he writes it down in an orderly way so we're going to look at first at the birth. Luke is going to start there. Then he's going to go to the life and the teaching and the, the uh, miracles of Jesus and then the death, resurrection, and ascension. And he does all of that so that Theophilus, who we many believe was a, um, some government official, the most excellent Theophilus, so that he would be certain of all he'd been taught. Theophilus didn't see Jesus, didn't know Jesus, but he'd heard all of these events with Jesus. We, too, have not seen Jesus but Luke says to you and to me, listen, I'm going to lay out the evidence for you so that you can, with assurance, believe the things of Jesus. So with that in mind, after his declaration of his purpose, let's begin with the first story, the birth of someone we know as John the Baptist. Verse 5, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blameless, blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So Luke begins his story in the time of Herod. Notice he's a historian. And we know in history that Herod ruled over Judea, this area around Jerusalem, from um, 37 to 4 BC. And it's actually the end of Herod's reign um, that John the Baptist and later Jesus were, they were born. So while Herod is ruling over this area under the Romans, there's a guy named Zechariah. He's married to uh, his wife, Elizabeth, and they're both from the line of Aaron. Now, if we go back 1,400 to 1,500 years earlier, so here we are 2,000 years uh, ago, back another 15, 14, uh, we go back to Moses at Mount Sinai. They come out of Egypt, and God says to, to Moses and the people, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Here's the law. Here's how you're to, to live. But he also said, I am going to be with you. My presence is going to be in the tabernacle. And then later, my presence is going to be in the temple, that I will dwell among the people. So instructions were given about the tabernacle. Now, if we go 1,400 years later to the time of Zechariah, he is from the line of Aaron, and Aaron's descendants, called the Levites, they were in charge of all the things in the temple. And we know historically there are around 20,000 males from this line. So my question to you is, in the temple of Jerusalem, how do you put 20,000 guys to work? That's a lot of people. So what they did was they divided these 20,000 into 24 divisions. And there was the division of Abijah. That's what Zechariah, he was in that division. And each of the 24 divisions would serve a week in the temple. So they'd have to give up a week of their work to go work in the, a week of, of whatever it was they were else involved in. They would work in the temple and they would do that twice a year. So here is Zechariah and he... Uh, is one of these priests. Notice that he and his wife, they're um, righteous in the sight of God, that they were looking ahead to what God would do in the Messiah and sending the Messiah, and so they were right with him and, and blameless that they were trying to follow the Lord. But notice this as well. Luke tells us that 
Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless. Um, it is very painful to want to have a child and not being able to have a child. But on top of that, in that day, in that culture, women were looked uh, on um, with kind of a disgrace that somehow God must be punishing you. That's not true, but that was the culture. So that was Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah. And then Luke also tells us that they were both very old. Notice they weren't old. They were very old. Okay, Woodside. Um, when are you old? I'm going to go out and say, hey, if you are 75 years old, we'll say you're old. Is everybody good with that? Not 70? If I make it 80, will you send me a Christmas gift? Okay, 75, you're old. 90, we would say, is very old. In that day, they had a shorter lifespan. So estimates are that Zechariah was around 70 years old, he and Elizabeth, somewhere around 70 years of age. They're both very old. Verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So here is Zechariah, his week of duty, and he is chosen by lot to go and burn incense in the temple. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him. If you Google uh, the second temple, which was uh, in that, standing in that day in Jerusalem, there's the outer courtyard, and then past the outer courtyard is the holy place. And very few people went into the holy place. Select priests would go in there, and in the holy place was the altar of incense, was the, the table of showbread, was the, the, the uh, lampstand, and that's where the priests would go into, select priests uh, into the holy place. And then there was a curtain, and on the other side of the curtain was the most holy place. And that's where the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, would go past the curtain into the holy place and make a sacrifice or, uh, uh, there on behalf of the people. So next to this opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies, which was a, it was a privilege, but it was a responsibility, next to that was the, the privilege of going into the holy place and there burning incense, lighting the candles, and praying to God on behalf of all the people who were assembled outside of the temple and waiting. And so here is Zechariah. He has this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If you can imagine his heart just pounding because this is, this is a sacred duty. And so there he is lighting the candles in front of the curtain when all of a sudden to his right, there's an angel of the Lord. How many of you, when you were reading this, I'm glad that Luke told me it was to the right. I was thinking it was to the left. Luke puts that in for us, to the right, verse 12. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. So here he is lighting the incense and praying on behalf of the people, and here's this angel, and he is startled and full of fear. Now, if you don't believe in angels, I mean, again, there's doubts there. Really? I've never seen an angel. Okay. We need to understand that there is a created order in which we live, but that created order is not eternal. So where did that created order come from? Well, God has revealed that there's an unseen realm where he exists, and he created this created order. But he also reveals in the unseen realm, he created angels to be his messengers, to bring his messages to the created order. And we see angels in Scripture. Now, there's only two angels mentioned in Scripture, Gabriel and Michael. 
And this angel is going to later identify himself as the angel of Gabriel. Next week when Mary is given the announcement of her child, the angel Gabriel gives that message. If we go back 500 years to the time of Daniel, do you remember Daniel, uh, the angel of Gabriel came to him and explained to da Daniel one of his visions about the end time events. So here's Gabriel to the right of Zechariah, and he's sent on a mission. And Again, when you see angels in scripture, the people respond in fear, not because angels are scary. Okay, angels are not scary. Angels are neither those golden-haired creatures you see on Christmas cards, okay, little cherubs. No, they're, angels are mighty and majestic, and our instinct is just to, to back up because they're mighty. And so he, uh, here he is with this angel. Can you imagine how Zechariah felt when he heard the words? Your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a boy, and you're going to name him John. Fifty years, probably. He's 70. He and his wife, probably around 20. And for 50 years, he's been praying. Maybe he stopped. We're not told somewhere there that they would have a child. Oh, your prayer is finally heard. And then after Gabriel... Um, shared that news with him. Then behind the altar, all the blue, blue balloons came up and they popped and there was blue powder everywhere. Uh, a gender reveal, right? So there is Zechariah hearing this announcement from Gabriel, verse 14. He, speaking of the son, will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Zechariah, let me tell you about this one that's going to be born to you in Elizabeth. First, he's going to be a joy and delight to you. I mean, imagine childless, and you finally have a boy, and to other people as well. They're going to be joyful and delighted in him. I was thinking this week of our evergreen uh, ministry where uh, older uh, folks, um, uh, they get together and, you know, there's a meal and listen to, they sing and all of that. Could you imagine those of you that go to evergreen if you show up and uh, a 90-year-old couple are there and they say to you, hey, guess what? We're going to have a child, <laughs> right? I don't think you'd be full of joy at that point. You'd be like, yeah, right, okay, really? This child is going to be a delight to many. Second notice, that he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be used of God in a mighty way. Third, he's never going to drink. Number four, a reference to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will be on him even in the womb of your wife, Elizabeth. And very interest, interesting that a little while later, after Elizabeth is pregnant, her cousin Mary comes to see her, and John, in the womb of Elizabeth, we're told, leaps for joy when the presence of Mary, who is carrying the Messiah, comes to the door. Interesting, the Holy Spirit at work even in the womb. And then notice as well that he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. That he is a prophet, this is who we will come to know as John the Baptist. Luke will later get there in his letter. But John the Baptist is going to call people back to the Lord, but not just this. This is what we want to focus on today. Verse 17. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah is told that your son, there's coming a day where he's going to go before the Lord, the Messiah. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Matthew chapter three, in um, Luke chapter 3, Luke will tell us, um, and speaking of the prophecy from Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 40, 700 years earlier, Isaiah said that there's someone crying in the wilderness, make straight the ways for the Lord. And Luke says in, in chapter 3, that's John the Baptist. Here he says, uh, Gabriel says to Zacharias, that your son is that one, your John. But notice he is coming in the, the spirit and power of Elijah. 
So he's like the prophet Elijah. Very interesting, John the Baptist and Elijah, both out in the wilderness, both sharing the message of repent and, and turn to the Lord, both dressed in a way, similar way. So he will come in the spirit of Elijah, and he's going to give a message that's going to turn people's hearts to one another, parents to their children, children to their parents. Again, when, when the message is given to get right with God, if you are right with God, he's going to work in your heart to want to get right with people, to do your part. And so he's going to be at work doing that. And so that is this one that is to be born. But why is this significant? 400 years earlier, God, through the prophet Malachi, prophesied about this day that's to come that this one before the Lord is going to be born and going to prepare the way. Notice in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. So if you want to turn to the last book of the Bible, of the Bible, of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Here's a prophecy. God says, see or behold, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with, a total, with total destruction. The, the, the message is God doesn't want to judge. He's a God of mercy. He wants people to turn uh, to him. And so he says, I will send the prophet Elijah. Well, to or when is he sending him? Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord when he comes. He's speaking about the second coming of Christ. When Jesus comes again, there's this tribulation, things are not good on earth, and when, uh, before Jesus the Messiah, the Lord comes, Elijah is going to come. If you uh, look at Revelation 11, there's two witnesses. Who are these two witnesses that are sharing the message, get right with God? Many believe they're Moses and Elijah. So that is the far fulfillment of this prophecy in Malachi 4. But the near fulfillment, Gabriel says, hey, your son, he's the one that was, was prophesied about as well. That he's not Elijah, but he's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he too is going to prepare the way for the Lord. So Gabriel is quoting to Zechariah that your son is the fulfillment of the promise that God made 400 years years ago. Now, why is this so important for us to understand? Okay, 400 years. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. The last promise in, in the Old Testament is that this forerunner is going to come before the Lord, before the Messiah. 400 years earlier, he made that promise. That's the book of Malachi. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the New Testament. And uh, before, between those two um, events, there were 400 years of silence where God did not make any promises. God did not speak. It's known as the intertestamental time. For 400 years, God was just silent. So, in the Old Testament, with the first man, the first woman, after they sinned, God made the first promise. He said that there's coming through the lineage of Eve someone that's going to crush the head of the serpent. That is a promise, that is a prophecy about Jesus. On the cross, Jesus would crush Satan and defeat him. So that is a promise of the Messiah. And then as you go through the Old Testament, there are all of these promises about the Messiah that's coming. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to spend his infancy in Egypt. He's going to be raised in Nazareth. He's going to be from the line of Abraham. He's going to be pierced for our transgressions. He's going to be crushed for our iniquities. He's going to die for us. All of those prophecies are in the Old Testament. And come to Malachi, all of those prophecies, anything from the Lord, it all just stops and there's silence. And here for 400 years, the people are waiting. When is this Messiah going to come? When is he going to come? Interesting, at the time of Jesus, there were many other would-be Messiahs. I'm the one that was promised right around this first century. You look in history, it's amazing. And, and, and they're just waiting. For 400 years, God has not said a word. He did not speak. Have you ever felt in your life when you, in your relationship with God, that he was just silent, 
God, I'm praying for this. When are you going to do something? Are you doing anything? Are you really there? Luke wants us to see that during those 400 years, God was working behind the scenes. So he includes this story about the birth of John the Baptist. This period of history, 400 years, we know a few things. If you, in the book of Daniel, with the, the image, um, Daniel has, uh, there's a vision and there's its image, the statue, and the statue represents that, hey, the Babylonian people are going to rule the known world, that empire. Then they're going to be defeated, and it's going to be the Medo-Persian world. And then it's going to be the Greeks, and then it's going to be the Romans. And his, in history, we see that played out. And during the 400 years before this announcement by Gabriel, the Greeks were in power, and then they would fall to the Romans. And while the Greeks were in power, Alexander the Great, he conquered the world. And with this um, event, he then issued that Greek would be the lingua franca of the day, the common language. So throughout the known world, you had people speaking all kinds of languages, but everybody was required to know some Greek. Secondly, when he and the other rulers of, of Greece fell to the Romans, the Romans came in during this, later in this period, and they, from history, we know they were ruthless and cruel. I mean, you bowed to the emperor, you bowed to Caesar, or you were just done away with. And so there was this time of peace where nobody fought back for the most part. It's, it's referred to as the Pax Romana, this time of peace. And the soldiers who would be fighting different people groups weren't fighting different people groups for the most part. They were building roads. And then third, also during this time, the Hebrew Old Testament, all of these prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament, it was, were, it was written in, in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. During that period, it was translated into Greek, the common language of the day. So, 400 years pass, John the Baptist is born, Later, Jesus is going to be born. 30 years or so pass. Jesus dies on a cross, is raised the third day. And before he ascends into heaven, he says to his followers, go and take the good news to the whole world. Make disciples of all nations. Help people hear the greatest news they could ever hear. And the first century, these first followers took it and turned the known world upside down. And what's very interesting, don't miss this, there were roads for them to travel on. There was a common language that they could talk to the people in. And there was an Old Testament scripture that was translated into Greek to help people understand. Do you see how God was at work in those 400 years? People are waiting, God, are you doing anything? And God behind the scenes is having roads built, Greek is a common language, and, uh, and, he, and there's a number of other things he was doing, but those are just three. When you are waiting for God, his absence or his silence in your life is not his absence. It's not his indifference. God has not forgotten you. Oh, Lord, I pray for this relationship. I pray for this, uh, you know, for my health. He has not forgotten you. He's always at work behind the scenes. So the Zech Zechariah hears, we're going to have a child. His name is John. And then we pick it up, the story in verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Some of you older guys, you need to take a tip from Zechariah's, right? Don't call your wife old. She is just well along. She's advanced. I'm old. She's just well along. What Zechariah is doing here is he's, he doesn't believe that this is going to happen. He's like, no, no, we're old. I don't believe what you're saying. You've got to get, prove it to me. Very interesting, when Mary is given the, the announcement of, of, of a child to be born to her by the same angel, Gabriel, she too ha has some doubts. She's like, how can this be? Like, I'm a virgin. But she says, but I'm the Lord's servant. I, I believe it's going to happen. I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I believe. Mary had doubts. In your Christian faith, there'll be times you have to wrestle through doubts. It's okay to wrestle through doubts and have doubts. That wasn't the case with Zechariah. It was unbelief. 
and there are consequences to unbelief. It's one thing for you to say, hey, I think there might be a God. I'm not sure. Maybe I should just try to find out more about him and, um, and you know, investigate the story of Jesus. That's okay. That's doubts, and you need to seek him. It's another thing to say, I just don't believe that stuff. That's unbelief, and there are consequences to unbelief. And Zechariah experiences a consequence. Verse 19, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So here is Zechariah in the temple, burning incense on behalf of the people. Here's this announcement from Gabriel, eventually makes his way back out of the temple, and what the priest typically would do was pronounce an Aaronic blessing on the assembled worshipers. Zechariah comes back out of the temple, they're there, and he's on mute. He can't talk to them. About 20, 25 years ago, some of you remember the game Charades? Did you play it at Christmas? Where you had to act out stuff, right? Okay, charades didn't start 20, 25 years ago. You can go back 2,000 years to a guy named Zechariah making signs. Can you imagine him coming out of the temple? Three words. First word. I don't know how you make an angel. I was always terrible at that game, but angel. Second word, you. Third word, baby. Right? Can you imagine them? <laughs> Verse 23. When his time of service was completed, so after the week, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Luke wants us to know that even when God is silent, he is at work. And what he has promised, he will bring to pass. Prophecy and the fulfillment of it, and Luke is connecting the dots. Hey, God made that promise, God made that promise, and we'll see through his book, and that's the fulfillment, that's fulfillment. Luke is wanting us to know that God is faithful to all his promises. And today, hear this. God is faithful to all his promises concerning you. God has said that he loves you. He made you. God has promised that if you turn from your sin and trust in the work of what his son Jesus did on the cross for you, all of your sins will be forgiven. And God promises you that you will have eternal life, that there really is a heaven to come. And God promises you that you are going to have a new body for all eternity. And you can say, that's too good to be true, and I have some doubts. But Luke wants us to know God fulfills his promises. And in your life, you need to know and hold on to those promises. Along the journey until that promised future, and we have hope as we go along, because one day we're going to see God in the face of Jesus. But as we go along the journey, we are called in our relationship with this God to ask him for things. And maybe you're praying for a baby. Maybe you're praying for a job. Maybe you're praying for a, a spouse. Maybe you're praying for whatever. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait. But please know this, never interpret silence, and God's not doing anything, as his indifference or that he's forgotten you. God is always at work in your life. You may not always get what you want. Sometimes you will, praise God. But you may not always get what you want, but you will always get what's best for, for you. We're told it in Romans 8, 28. And as a verse, I think, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're really a follower of Jesus, you need to memorize but we're told in Romans 8, 28, 
And we know that in all things, whether I get this or I don't get this, whether God does this or God doesn't do that, and we know in all things, God works. He's at work, even though it seems like he's silent. God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. I want to ask you today, this Christmas season, what are you waiting for? What are you longing for? Keep praying for that. But never interpret God's silence as his indifference. He's at work in your life. And as you go through life, you're going through life with this hope that whatever happens here, I have a wonderful future with Jesus. Hope is not a concept. It's not an idea. It's not a wish. It's a person, Jesus. Next week, we're going to look at his birth. But please understand that this week, God fulfilled the promise in sending that forerunner ahead with him. This Christmas season, may we wait for the Lord, may we be strong and take heart, and may we wait for the Lord, trusting that you will keep looking to the Lord this Christmas season. Would you please stand as the worship team comes? Today in the bigger story, the one that would come and be placed in a manger came to be the savior of the world. He would die on a cross for us. May we rejoice in that truth. May we praise him today.